So um, this is basically uh, based on a work in progress. Uh, Primer and I have been working on on this idea uh, since uh, since we were at the Free Culture Forum in Barcelona uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, we started tossing around this idea that maybe some of the things that we're seeing happening on the internet these days uh, have more to them than than just uh, interesting social changes. So. Um, basically, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, changes manifesting themselves and, uh, in the post-internet bubble of the 2000s uh, and moving on to today. Uh, we've seen a lot of really interesting changes, not just to uh, the way we use technology, but how s uh, society is structured around technology. And you know, the more you look at it, the more you come to the conclusion that it can't just be Ajax that's causing this. There's there's something else at work. So um, there's uh, policymakers are kind of figuring out what the internet is, and and they're getting a bit worried about it. Um, investors, people uh, in the financial uh, like funding companies, they they start to want um, a more realistic estimate of of what the technology is valued at. So. Um, we came up with this basic hypothesis that the changes we're seeing on the internet today are uh, structurally equivalent to changes that we saw in society during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then we started moving on through that. So in order to understand how this transition is working, I want to kind of justify it by looking first at pre-industrial societies and then post-industrial societies, then take the pre-cloud era internet and then the post-cloud era internet. So um, one of the main features of pre-industrial society or uh, craft production society is that all the manufacturing capacity was decentralized. Everything was organized into small units uh, distributed around farms, small villages, hamlets, etc. Um, and homesteading was a, a basic feature of that. Everybody just ran <coughs> uh, the household as the core element of production. So it wasn't uh, so much uh, everybody leaves work at 9 in the morning to go to the factory. It was more everybody uh, wakes up at 7 in the morning to start baking bread and then go and plow the uh, fields. Um, and a part of this was that transportation networks weren't very good. So uh, whatever was produced wasn't actually distributed far beyond the, the town. And when it was distributed far beyond the, the local area, it was incredibly costly and, and not uh, particularly good for, uh, for maintaining the quality of the goods. So uh, one aspect of this is that the society was highly meritocratic. Uh, people who were producing things locally, their reputation meant everything. Because if they were baking bread that poisoned everybody, then they wouldn't be very well trusted as bakers for much longer, and, and so on. So uh, whatever regulation happened in the society was based on reputation rather than a state that was in, uh, imposing some kind of rules. States at the time weren't actually that interested in regulating production capacity. They were more interested in uh, regulating violence and uh, extracting taxes. So uh, this led to an interesting intellectual property regime where uh, there was no formal structure for it. It was um, uh, the reason I use uh, knitting here is uh, when knitting came to um, Europe through uh, from the Middle East, it was originally imported through guilds uh, operating in Italy and uh, Southern Europe. And these guilds maintained the secret of how to knit because knitting was a very valued commodity. The knitted goods lasted a lot longer than, um, than the traditional felt clothing. So this was a valued commodity and they tried to maintain a, an intellectual monopoly on it. Then somebody reverse engineered it and now we all have knitted stuff. So then we come to the Industrial Revolution and say, okay, what, what happened there? And, well, one of the things is, everything became more centralized. And one of the reasons for that was that um, the machines themselves, the, the machines that we were using to replace human effort, were 
extremely expensive and they weren't very efficient to begin with. So uh, it made a lot more sense to build big machines and try and put a lot of production uh, devices um, uh, on the same on the same boiler or uh, on the same uh, steam engine because it uh, it was the best way to maximize efficiency. Also, it wasn't very easy to um, to make sure that uh, to basically get funding to build the machines. But because all this production capacity became more centralized, we saw urbanization. People were moving from the towns, etc., and and along with that came better transportation networks, which led to globalization of good services, labor capital, and so on and so on. So um, more and more globalization as a result of more and more centralization. It's a bit contradictory, somehow paradoxical, but you know that's kind of what happened. And because the machines themselves were so expensive and so powerful, then the, the meritocratic element changed into a plutocratic element. And there's another reason for that. In the pre-industrial era, there was no government or state reason for regulation. But once everything got uh, well uh, globalized, it was less likely that you knew who baked your bread. It was less likely that you knew who built your car. So the state increasingly regulated the production. And at the same time, because there was more and more um, uh, exploitation of workforce, there was a greater need to regulate the workforce itself and try and create um, uh, all these workforce regulation rules. So the third kind of main, uh, main thing that happened with regard to regulation was that uh, the state started to enforce intellectual monopolies. And this, of course, is uh, becoming increasingly uh, interesting. I mean, it uh, starts off with uh, things like the Statute of Anne and moving on to uh, more modern things, which uh, we'll, we'll get to in a bit. So going through that transition, we see that there's a lot of different mechanisms, production local aids, worker local aids, goods distribution, production authority, uh, regulation, and intellectual monopolies. And all this transitioned in more or less this way, right? So what does the early internet look like? Well. It was very decentralized. Everybody had their own IP address, and it was actually a design aspect of the early ARPANET and, and leading on to the internet that everything needed to be de decentralized just for the uh, stability and um, security of the network itself. And because of this, everybody just set up a server in their, in their basement or, or living room or bedroom or wherever. It, we didn't really buy hosting services unless we didn't know what we were doing. And um, and this also spawned a lot of local communities. There was a lot of uh, localization, and it's again paradoxical to talk about localization in a globalized context. But still, uh, if you look at uh, early BBSs, forums, IRC servers, uh, and even uh, these different social networks at the time, whether it was things like Pi.is uh, in Iceland or Ich Galleria in, in Finland. Uh, or CU2 in the Netherlands, it, it was always very localized, very, um, very community driven on local scale. And again, highly meritocratic. You get the same kind of uh, trust <coughs> idea where, where people are valued on their merits in the early internet. Uh, people who do really cool stuff get, get uh, put on slides and <laughs> others uh, get uh, not so much. So. Then you get to the regulation part. Who gets to uh, who gets to submit code, and you get things like this is a Git uh, contribu contribution tree. Basically, people who have showed that they have merit, they have the ability to commit code, and you just uh, it becomes a trust network. And finally, the intellectual property regime is very informal, um, mostly because nobody really cared in the early internet. Up until the time of maybe Napster, nobody really gave a damn about what was happening on the internet because that was not where the owners of the intellectual monopolies were actually trying to extract wealth from. 
then Napster came around and built the largest database of, of human creativity that we had ever seen for free in about six months. And uh, suddenly they started caring a great deal. So then kind of comes the cloud era. And, and it's hard to say when this happened. I mean, it's uh, maybe after the bubble, maybe um, sometime in the last decade, at least. And you know, maybe it's not even here yet properly. But either way, we, we've already seen an increased centralization of services. We, we, these are the largest websites on, on the planet. And they account for uh, lots and lots of users, uh, <coughs> Facebook alone. Uh, is an example of urbanization happening on the internet where uh, we have more and more large hubs of creativity and, and production. The production, uh, the produce of internet activities is creative works and the, the uh, result of, of people thinking in, in unison. So this is just uh, how, how fast it's been growing. And that's about 7% of humanity, right? 70 largest cities are not even scratching the surface on that. So um, another aspect is it's more financially driven because there's a greater interest in, um, in return on investment. And this might be a, an element of efficiency because uh, as we saw in the, the industrial era, efficiency trumped out over, uh, over self-sufficiency. And here we're seeing the exact same thing. If we have 10,000 social networks uh, and they're all kind of small, then that's not going to be as efficient as having one thing that is massively huge. <coughs> and then the activities themselves become globalized in the sense that uh, everything we try to do becomes not something that we try to impact on a local scale, but something that we try to blast out to as many as possible. And uh, alongside this comes the idea of s hosting everything on local servers and so on. And because, you know, this opens up a lot, a lot of complicated questions. State regulation becomes a very important thing. Um, there's uh, uh, treaties on cybercrime, there's all kinds of internet uh, related task forces and such uh, trying to uh, stem off uh, every kind of crime imaginable because the states are actually worried that, that their power is being diminished by the net. And the companies that had certain power uh, as well in the industrial era, they are also experiencing that their power is being diminished by the net unless they happen to be one of the large websites. So they're all calling for more regulation. And again, some the general public is also calling for more, more regulation. They want to be safe from, uh, from internet stalkers or credit card fraud or, or that kind of thing. So uh, throughout the entire thing, uh, we're, we're seeing more regulation, more movement towards this, this kind of globalized political system. Okay. And then we get pervasive state enforcement of, of intellectual property regimes that are just pulled over from the, the old system. This is uh, the, a screenshot from ACTA. Um, yeah, that, ACTA is kind of the, uh, the epitome. It's not a particularly important document except in the sense of how it was produced and what for. Uh, and what it actually says isn't all that crazy. I mean, we've already seen a lot of other uh, very bad laws come around, uh, IPRED, for example, and uh, so on. So we're seeing that there's more and more corporate lobbying for more and more intellectual property management. And this is, uh, this is just to serve goals which made sense a couple of uh, decades ago but don't really make sense today is it's just losing power so again we see that all these different mechanisms are transitioning in more or less the same way okay it's um, so that's kind of an attempt to justify the idea that the internet is becoming industrialized but this is kind of what it comes down to for me. Uh, I've come to the paradoxical conclusion that technology must be protected from man. Uh, Valery Legosov said this about two or three months after uh, the investigation of the Chernobyl uh, disaster, which he was the uh, chief of, um, had finished. 
and he he came to this weird conclusion that you know that disaster wasn't actually uh, something that the technology had caused, but rather how humans interfaced with the technology caused it. And that's that's an important distinction because there's no new technology on the internet today compared with you know a decade ago, except maybe Ajax, right? Uh, HTML5, sure, and you know, that kind of thing. But really, it doesn't fundamentally change what the internet is. It's just a minor change in the way we think about the internet and. Our interactions are actually changing the social structures of the net. So you can come up with whatever value judgments you want about the meaning of industrialization of the net, whether it's good, whether it's bad, but the fact is that it's happening. Okay. So then we come to the questions. Like what are the implications of this? What what can we foresee in the future? There's going to be more centralization, maybe. Does this change the way democracy works? Does this change the way we create new things, new ideas, how we share new ideas? Uh, will there be uh, security risks for us? That kind of thing. Um, are there any alternatives? Could we do things differently? I'm a big fan of peer-to-peer -peer ideologies where decentralization is good. But you know, maybe that's not. Um, not necessarily the right way to go. Direct democracy might be something to look into. Maybe we just need to change our business models or our expectations of corporate uh, organization. Maybe we need to take up anarcho or something, or, or maybe we just need to throw computers out the window. Yeah, you know, the question is, what do we do if we don't like this idea of industrialization? And then, I think this is the most important question. How does this translate back into civil society? What does the industrialization of the internet mean to us as a culture, as human beings, and you know, uh, because information is playing a more and more important role in our daily lives, and the internet is the manifestation of all the information capacity that we have. Right. So changes in the social structure of the internet might actually have pretty adverse effects on our culture if we don't be careful about it. And uh, I'm, I'm very fond of the kind of added question. Is the existence of a free and open internet fundamentally uh, contradictory to the existence of modern nation states? This is something that I haven't found the answer to yet. We, we, we've just started to explore this, but it's kind of uh, the core of, of what we're all doing. So uh, we uh, informally founded the Cloud Disappreciation Society yesterday. Um, but, uh, we haven't actually got a website yet, but you know, uh, just as a funny last note. So, yeah, um, all the credits. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thanks. Any questions for Samari? Yeah, uh, but I need to go back to your slide oh. a bit, sorry, if you can do that. Um, you, you were talking about the, the move from regulation by reputation to the inf and uh, informal intellectual property regimes yeah. on the internet, not, not the bakers. Oh, not the bakers. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you said, you, you, um, you said that the development came because of the technology. Uh, you, uh, sorry, we we, uh, we abandoned the informal intellectual property regimes. And yeah. I, um, I, I would I, I yes and no. I, I it looks like that, but what what we actually did was we there were groups that realized there was a threat. We don't develop regulation unless we f someone feels that. Yeah. Not necessarily the right person, but sure. Yeah. Okay. So that uh, was more if you can develop that a bit. Okay. Um, I'm still not sure I understand exactly what you're asking about, but if, if I, no, I I was more confused about the way in which you argue, but I, I didn't manage to okay. take notes on everything. Okay, so, so the idea of um, uh, because you no longer know who's servicing you, yeah. you cannot create personal uh, relationships with everybody who's doing that. So uh, that that layer of obscurity and anonymity might cause there to be an, a reason to say okay, whoever is providing this kind of service might need to um, uh, might need to adhere to some standard 
Otherwise, when something bad happens, it will be harder for me to place blame. Um, now, this ties in with the intellectual property in, in some interesting ways. Maybe uh, primarily that um, when you need the standardization, then, then people who are trying to enforce the standards, they want some kind of ownership over those standards. And yeah, so they make a claim, we want, um, uh, we want to have control of this idea. Uh, whether that actually works in practice, you know, the, uh, there, there's other motivation, of course, behind wanting to own things. But, uh, but uh, you know, the I think the line of thought somehow connects. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, there's one word which sort of lacked in that discussion, and that's the globalization. By putting the information about the consequences of an action further away from you yeah. turns everyone in that chain into psychopaths. Okay. <laughs> uh, basically, basically, uh, you say because I don't know the consequences of my actions and I have no sensible way of finding out. Sociopaths, then, rather than psychopaths. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, then you sort of give up. And you just yeah. say that uh, I'm just looking out for number one. I don't really care if any children get hurt when this shoe is made. Mm. I have no idea. And even if there was a sticker saying made by yeah. child slave labor, you don't, you're not going to be able to connect yeah. that mm. information to the bleeding child in front of you and the, act, and then the fact that you're the one hurting that child indirectly. Yeah. And, and by this, these informational sort of obscuri obscuri yeah. obscurities and so you're saying So you're saying... Um, the you know, people are using ignorance as a defense when they're justifying their non-participation uh, in actions against something that we would, in a smaller community, re rebel against. Right. Um, okay, that's an interesting thought. How does that translate onto the internet? Well, the internet. One way, the one thing that the internet has done is allowed that production happen very far away and that information to be obscured. Yeah, so okay, Facebook for example, I, I, I don't really want to be picking on Facebook all the time, it's, it's not productive, but um, they are kind of an example of this because when somebody is making an app or, or whatnot, for example I, I turned on that uh, HTTPS only feature that's in Facebook now and uh, then there's certain apps which just won't allow that. So Facebook says, oh, d would you like to turn off HTTPS so you, you can see this app? And it isn't a temporary thing, it's just, it's final. Uh, you, you can turn it back on, but you have to go through the same system. And, you know, somebody would maybe raise objections to this if this wasn't something that uh, has been obscured by chains of, of I don't know who did this. So, um, I'm just... Yeah, the, the globalization and obscure... Obsc Obfuscation of information has to yeah. be in your little yeah. chain of train of thought. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Any? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you. Primavera. Oh yeah. Sure. We've got to. actually from uh, island chain north of Japan. Okay. I, I just like it because the clouds are really nice. Yeah. Um, uh, nice to see them take your clouds over a volcanic cone. Oh, if you hit... Uh,